I pray that every week that's the legitimate cry of our heart, that all we want, all we want is for him to be glorified and for him to be lifted high. Did you come here today to lift him up? Well, lift up your king today. This is Palm Sunday. Lift up your king today on Palm Sunday. Hosanna in the highest on Palm Sunday. Jesus said, if you don't praise me, it's okay because even the stones will cry out. So give him a Palm Sunday praise. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So, so, so I'm excited about Palm Sunday because Palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week. And, and Holy Week is the most important week in the life of the church. Right. It, it's why we're Christians It's why we have hope. It's why we go to church. Um, and so, you know, this Friday, we got Good Friday service. We got about 100 people registered. So if y'all haven't registered, this room has a way more than 100 people in it. So if y'all haven't registered for Good Friday service, register today, because that is going to be a powerful moment to, to prepare you for Easter. You know, sometimes you got to get prepared to get into God's presence. I know, I know we're so used to just coming, to presence, coming into the presence of God through the cross of Jesus Christ, and we get that privilege, amen, but at the same time, there's a preparation that comes with getting into God's presence. Good Friday is going to prepare you for that. And then Easter, we got two services. Somebody say two. Two services. So that means there's no excuses. You see, we got a packed house, but we made room for auntie, uncle, Ray Ray, Pookie, all of them, Shaquisha, all of them is coming. They can come in, and, and the service times are 10 a.m., which is early for them, I know, because Saturday night be real. But then we got a 12 p.m. service. Amen to somebody who wants to sleep in some Sundays. Amen. So y'all got both as an option. So, so take advantage of that. How many of y'all are excited about week two of Cheat Code? Yeah, well, did week one bless you? Did week one bless you? Amen. Uh, well, well, last week we learned that God has built in a cheat code into the game of life. And his name is J-E-S-U-S. And we learned that when Jesus becomes our cheat code, we get a competitive advantage in life at whatever level we're on. But what I didn't want to do in this series is just do what we normally do in church, which is give us powerful truth without giving us practical application. Because if we're honest, we don't need more information. We need more implementation. I mean, y'all know this is true. I mean, as a kid, I knew vegetables were good for me, but I never ate them because I didn't know why. And if we're honest today, we know that Jesus is good for us, but we don't know why. We don't know what difference Jesus actually makes in, in the way that we live, in the way that we love, in the way that we date, amen, in the way that we work. But in these next few weeks, we're going to explore the everyday practical advantages that Jesus has when you activate him do, 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 as your cheat code, amen? <laughs> so that leads me to today's text. I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. It says, for I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, somebody say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Oh, that just sets somebody free. And his grace to me was not without effect. It was not in vain. It did not go to waste. No, instead, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father God, we thank you for grace. Grace that covers us. Grace that forgives us. Grace that renews us. And grace that humbles us. Because to be honest, Lord, many of us need to just sit down and be humble. But God, I thank you for grace. Grace is a game changer. God, may your grace cover this word. May your grace cover this preacher. May your grace cover this congregation. May your grace cover whose ever ears this sermon reaches. God, we are asking that your word go forth and not come back to you void. I'm praying, Father, for permission to preach. May you get this dust of a man out the way so your people can see you. And may the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, God, our strength and our redeemer. Oh, agree with that said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
Amen. The first advantage that Jesus gives you when you activate him as your cheat code is a superpower called grace. Grace is amazing, but it's also complicated. Grace is incredible, but it's also difficult. It's complicated not because it's hard to understand. Grace is pretty easy to understand. It's complicated because it's hard for us to accept. Grace can be defined as God's unmerited favor to us on Christ's behalf. Let me say that again because you're taking notes. I want to give you a second. Grace is God's unmerited. That means it's not earned. It's not achieved. It is not accomplished. It is God's unmerited favor towards us on Christ's behalf. You can break grace down into an acronym because, you know, I like to make stuff easy for us to remember. You can break grace down to an acronym. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense which is what makes grace difficult to receive. I got help in the back. I love y'all back there. (laughs) This is what makes grace difficult to receive because we need grace more than anything else, but it's the hardest thing for us to accept because grace humbles us before it empowers us. We love being empowered, but we don't love being humbled. (laughs) We like getting the power, but we don't like getting the pow pow. But what we learn today is that we live our lives with a disadvantage when we reject grace in order to project the lie of performance. Because when you don't live by grace, you got to live by performance. So we live with a practical disadvantage in life when we reject grace in order to project performance. That leads me to my first point. Grace gives us the advantage of humility. Humility is an advantage doesn't feel like it, but it is. Today's passage was written by a man named Paul. How many of us have heard of Paul? Okay. If there was anybody that needed the grace of God, it was Paul. If there was anybody that was a product of the grace of God, it was Paul. When Paul was a non-Christian, he was a goon. Goony goo goo. He was trying to get Christians locked up and cleaned up every chance he could get. Paul was so thirsty to come at the neck of every Christian that he went to the government to get permission to persecute the church. But then Paul received God's cheat code, J-E-S-U-S. And when he encountered Jesus, Jesus unlocked the superpower in his life called grace. And his life changed forever. So Paul writes this passage after he's experienced the cheat code and he experiences the grace that comes with him. He now says, I am the least. Somebody say least. I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. When Paul says, I am the least of the apostles, he's saying what I am now, I haven't always been. Can anybody say what you are now is not what you've always been? Paul says, I was an enemy of God because I, and because of that, I don't even deserve to be called a child of God. Paul says, I'm called apostle now, but I was called abuser then. He says, I'm called a minister now, but I was called a murderer then. When Grace met Paul, Paul wasn't on his way to church. Paul was on his way to kill people. Grace met Paul on his way to do dirt, on his way to act a fool, on his way to hurt people God cared about. Grace met Paul when he was going somewhere that he had no business going, when he was doing some things he had no business doing, when he was chilling with people he had no business being with, when he was dating folks, he had, I'm, I got to move, man. I got to move. <laughs> the comma after Paul's name now says man of God. It used to say enemy of God. What does the comma after your name say? Oh, I'm not talking about the commas that we're proud of. I'm not talking about the commas that we put on our resume. Commas like B.A., B.S., M.S.W., 
MBA, MDiv, PhD, D-Men. No, no, I'm talking about the commas we ain't proud of. I'm talking about the commas we don't put on our resume. I'm talking about words like freak -a leak <laughs> Drug addict. Sex addict. Gambler. Drug dealer. Liar. Cheater. Unloyal. Gossiper. Thought Tiana. Some of y'all are looking at me like, who, 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 me, who, me, Pastor K, who, me? Yes, you! Yes, you! Got your head down. Stop, stop trying to take notes. This ain't even note-taking time. This is not even note-taking time. I ain't even saying nothing deep. Pick your head up. Yes, you. Try to take notes. You don't need to write down what you were. You know you was the freak of league. You don't need to write that down. You don't need that. See, that's the problem with some of us in church. Some of us church folks, we've been in church so long that we actually don't think we need grace. We, we come to church every week to project the smile and a live performance and to act like we don't need God's grace. Or we'll never say it, but our actions show it. The way we talk about people shows it. The way we gossip about people shows that we don't think we need grace. The way we look down on them in church shows us the way we don't think we need grace. The way we judge people in our hearts shows us that we don't think they need grace. The way we speak about people in leadership. When we won't lift a finger to help them. Shows us that we think that we don't need grace. If we're really real, some of us think that other people need grace a little bit more than we do. But here's something for free. Don't make the mistake of judging people just because they sin differently than you. You sin too, boo-boo. You need grace too, boo-boo. But it's so easy to judge people who sin differently than us. God's grace can't overcome what you won't admit. God's grace can't bless what you won't confess. I never understand how we come to church and sit here like we don't have reasons to thank him. We sit here like, why he's so loud? See him all extra and all that running down the aisle. Why he running? Why she so extra? Why she always screaming hallelujah, all that stuff? Why she doing all that? She just doing that to get attention. No, she remembered where she was when Grace found her. He remembered what he was doing when Mercy met him. See, if anybody knows the real you, not the church you, not the gathering you, the IG you, the Snapchat you, the girl strip you, the guys night you, the Vegas you, the Puerto Rico you, Puerto Rico, the DR you, the Jamaica you, the Bahamas you, the deceiving you, the lying you, the cheating you, the gossiping you, the imperfect you, the inconsistent you, the insecure you. The bitter you. I can stay here all day. I can stay here till y'all get real. Pastor K, why are you going in? Why are you going in? I'm going in because some of you sit here like you don't need the grace of God. You sit here every Sunday like you're doing God a favor. You're not doing God a favor. You should be praising God for favor. Who am I helping? If we take grace for granted, then we will give God average praise for amazing grace. We can't appreciate grace if we think we deserve it. We can't appreciate our status with God if we think we earned it. We can't appreciate what we don't deserve if we think we've earned that. And when you presume the grace of God, he will take it away. Don't miss this. This may be the most important part of the sermon. When you presume the grace of God, he will snatch that thing right back. When you presume the call of God, he will take it back. When you presume the anointing of God, he'll take it back. God appointed Saul to be king. But Saul exploited the grace of God. And God took that anointing away. Zoop, give me that back. Moses was one of the greatest prophets who ever lived. I love Moses. I love, well, I got a lot of me and Moses. But Moses struck the rock twice out of anger. 
He took for granted that it was grace that he could even strike it once. Did you hear what I just said? He took for granted it was grace that he could even strike it once. Why did God keep him out of a promise? Because he struck it twice. Because Moses' anger led him into sin because Jesus is the rock. And you don't strike Jesus twice. You don't touch God's anointing more than once. God's anointed is only struck down once. And so because Moses presumed the grace of God, even the great prophet Moses died outside the promise. See, what humbles me is if Moses died outside the promise, so will I. If Moses died outside the promise, so will you. Israel was God's chosen people, but they rejected his grace in Jesus. So Paul says to the church, granted, they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by what? You stand by faith. So do not be arrogant, but tremble. Did you hear what he said? Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. If God didn't spare his chosen people, he will not spare you either. Without grace, we become arrogant. We look down our nose at people. We talk about them behind their backs. But that's why the first step to experiencing grace is admitting that you need it. And God put this warning in my spirit for us today as a church because I'm concerned that there may be some of us in here who really don't think we need grace. We, 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 we think grace is like a help, helpful add-on. We, we, we think grace is like a number two. Like, you know, God, I'll take a double portion and a blessing. You can supersize that. I'll take some breakthrough on the side. Oh, yeah, you can give me some condiments of grace. Like, like grace ain't an add-on. Grace is the whole thing. Grace is the whole meal. So God put this warning in my spirit to our church. And it's my job as a shepherd of the house to shepherd our church when the Lord speaks. The Lord put this warning in my spirit. I want you to hear it from Romans. The warning says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? That's a real question. Does this mean nothing to you? If it doesn't, God bless you. But you got to be honest. Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you away from your sin? His kindness is intended to turn you towards repentance. Grace doesn't enable sin. It empowers you to turn away from it. Did you hear what I just said? And this leads me then to my second point, because after grace humbles us, because we, we need that sit down and be humble treatment, after grace humbles us, it changes us. Second point, grace gives us the advantage. Somebody say advantage. It gives us the advantage, advantage in everyday life of a new identity. The bad news always comes before the good news. The bad news is, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's bad news. That ain't good news, because all means all. All is every single one of us. All is everybody we know. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All is our bay and our crush and the people we look up to and the people we aspire to be like. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the good news is, I said the good news is, I said the good news is, what we couldn't do for ourselves, God has done for us in Jesus. I said what we couldn't do for ourselves, God has done for us in Jesus. See, without grace, we default to living with a performance identity. What do I mean by a performance identity? Life is a game. And without a cheat code, the only way to win the game is to perform. Without a cheat code that gives you an advantage in the game, the only way to win it is to perform your way through it. And because of that, we default to either a secular or a religious performance identity. I'm going to talk about it. If we have a secular performance identity, we get our value from making a lot of chicken. I ain't talking about food. I'm talking about money. Making a lot of chicken, having a nice body, going to an elite school, having a lot of followers on IG and everywhere else, having people that know our name and you can Google me, Google me, Google me. Uh oh, you trying to act like I ain't a big deal? Google me. 
We can even make being woke an idol. Don't duck. Did I spill some tea? Being woke is a secular identity we can turn into an idol. <laughs> but if your identity is based on these things, then you have to look down your nose on people who aren't like that. Don't miss this. You have to look down your nose on poor people if your identity is based on being rich. You have to look down your nose on uneducated people if your identity is based on going to an elite school. You have to look down your nose on unwoke, sunken people. If your identity is based on being wokey, woke, woke, woke. And listen, I love y'all, but I can't play woke Olympics with y'all. Y'all ain't gonna have me out here pulling my hamstring trying to keep up with the woke Olympics. We talk about justice because Jesus is a God of justice. I don't talk about justice and, and, and race and gender and all these intersectionalities because it's popular in our culture. And when our culture wasn't talking about it, the church was. Go look up a man named MLK. Go look, ah oh man, I gotta move, man. You have to look down your nose on poor people and all these other people if your identity comes from being performance, from performance. But performance identities also take a religious form too. There's plenty of Christians who think they're better than people because of their religious performance. Can I talk to the church folks? Some of us think we're better than people because we dress modestly. Some of us think we're better than people because we serve in the ministry. Some of us think we're better than people because we pay our tithes. Some of us think we're better than people because we don't listen to secular music. Some of us think we're better than people because we can quote scripture up, down, left, right. But what good is all that religiosity when you struggle with the greatest sin of all, <clears throat> pride? The Bible doesn't say sin comes before the fall. It says pride comes before the fall. Pride is the only thing in the universe that turned angels into demons. Grace gives us a new identity. Somebody say new identity. Somebody say new identity. Say it like you mean it, new identity. Grace says you're a sinner. That means that you can't keep God's standards. You can't even keep your own standards. I mean, let's be real. You said you was going to get in shape for the new year. You ain't been to the gym since Valentine's Day. Get it together, boo-boo. Grace says you're broken. You're so broken. You're so desperate. You're so far from God that only God himself coming to earth and being crucified and whipped was enough to save you. But the Bible also says, I said the Bible also says you're so loved, you're so accepted, you're so forgiven, you're so precious to him that Jesus knew he had to do all of that and he did it anyway. You ever ask somebody how you doing? Let, 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 let me just give y'all something for free. When, when somebody asks you how you're doing, they really don't care. They really don't care. Because, because when you ask somebody how you're doing and then they start to lay it on you, well, I'm going through this. I mean, I mean my back hurt. I got, this, I got this pain in my knee. I mean, I, I'm, I'm struggling in relationships. I mean, I'm single, ready to mingle. I, I'm broke. I can't pay my bills. I got this little bunion on my foot. Like, but, 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 but Jesus, I said Jesus actually cares what we're going through and was willing to do all of the work it took to get us through it and save us from it. See, we're pushed into a performance identity when we have to live without a cheat code. We're pushed into a performance identity by people who don't have a cheat code. Stop letting people who don't have a cheat code drive, be in the driver's seat of your life. Some of y'all got people who don't even know the cheat code who drive and determine your daily decisions. Bye, Felicia. See, see, we pushed into performance identity by culture, by upbringing, by peer pressure, by insecurities, which means all of our activity is driven by fear. If you look at the decisions you're making and the things you're doing, I guarantee you the majority of them, if they're not driven by grace, they're driven by fear. Fear of letting people down, fear of looking stupid, fear of being alone, fear of being rejected, fear, 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 fear. But you can't be scared into a relationship with God. You must be loved into one. 
The only way to get in a relationship with God is by being loved into his presence. You can't be feared or scared into his presence. You must be forgiven into his presence. That's why Paul says, I'm the least. Somebody say least. I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the least of the apostles. And I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But Paul, why are you being false? Why, stop, stop showing false humility, Paul. You planted more churches than every apostle that ever lived. You wrote half the New Testament. Your preaching time will heal people. How can you say I'm the least of any? But family, this is the practical advantage that a grace identity unlocks in your life. Paul is not speaking from false humility, he's speaking from truth. Because a grace identity keeps your testimony close to your ministry. I said a grace identity keeps your testimony close to your ministry. It keeps your testimony close to your leadership. It keeps your testimony close to your dream. It keeps your testimony close to your relationships. It keeps your testimony close to your money. It keeps your testimony close to your decisions. A grace identity always keeps what you were close to what God is making you. Paul doesn't need the church to remind him who he was. He, needs, he reminds the church of who he was. He says, I was a slanderer. I was a persecutor. I was an abuser. But God. I said, but God. I was broke. I wasn't in my right mind. I wasn't making good decisions. I didn't know who I was. But God. God took the comma behind my name and took what away what I was and put grace on it. I said he put grace on it. And now I'm an apostle. Now I'm a preacher. Now I'm a leader. Now I'm a child of God. Paul went from being a persecutor to a preacher the same way I went from being a womanizer to a worshiper. The same way I went from being a hoe to a husband. Y'all came to fake today? It's time to get real in the presence of God. The same way that somebody in here goes from a liar to a leader. It's the same way Paul went from being a persecutor to a preacher. If you need the grace of God today, make some noise. If you're grateful for the grace of God today, make some noise. He did it by grace. Somebody say by grace. He did it by grace. Grace makes you unbreakable. Grace makes you unbreakable because it admits what you were, but it keeps it, but it puts it underneath what you are. Grace affirms your past without compromising your future. Stop denying what you need to be delivered from. I said stop denying what you need to be delivered from. Some of you walk around here so nonchalant about your sin. You know it's wrong, but you make light of it. But grace doesn't deny sin. It delivers you from it. Grace doesn't deny what you need to be delivered from. We think grace says Jesus loves you. No, it doesn't. Grace says how much Jesus suffered to love you. Some of y'all have a rebuttal. Oh, Jesus love me. Jesus love me. I know Jesus love me, so Jesus love me. So what? Why you all in my business? Jesus love me. No, that's not what grace says. Grace does not say Jesus loves you. Grace says this is how much Jesus suffered to love you. <laughs> grace doesn't say just Jesus loves me. It says Jesus loved me enough to die for me. Grace says Jesus loved me enough to be whipped for me. Grace said Jesus loved me enough to be rejected for me. Grace said Jesus loves me enough to change me. If the way you see yourself hasn't radically changed after you've gotten the grace of God, then you haven't experienced the grace of God. Why do we think we can be in relationship with God and not change? Relationships change people. I said relationships change people. I, let me just do it real quick. Let me do a poll. How many of you are married? Married people in the house. Throw your hands up. Married, married folks. Some of y'all are like, you better put your hand up. Don't play. Right? Married folks, married folks. Are you the same now that you were on your wedding day? I can't. Are you the same now that you were on your wedding day? Hey, who's a parent? Parents in the house. Well, my parents say, hey, ah, parents, let's go. Are you the same now that you were the day that you had your child? 
Who has a, I mean, somebody said no real hard, dad. Dad. Who has a bestie in the house? Bestie's in the house, bestie's now, bestie. Bestie, y'all about to get brunch with your bestie after this, right? How different is your life right now because that person is in it? So why do we think we can be in relationship with somebody greater than your spouse, greater than your child, greater than your bae, greater than your crush, greater than your boo, and greater than your bestie, and not be changed? Why do we think we can be in relationship with perfection and not be purified? <laughs> Grace allows imperfect people into, into God's personal space. Did you hear what I said? Grace allows imperfect people. See, we don't like people in our personal space. God moved heaven and earth to get you in his personal space. Grace lets imperfect people into proximity, into the proximity of perfection. See, being in church doesn't change you, but being in a relationship with God does. Oh, you must believe that's a cheat code. And Paul is a perfect case study of that. I want to give you all real quick a little case study on Paul. The longer that Paul walked with Jesus, the more grace changed him. You want to know, how do I know if I'm really growing in my, in my walk with God? Practical advances, amen? Practical, let's go. Well, Paul shows us, the longer he walked with God, the more the grace of God changed him. Paul wrote this passage 20 years after he became a Christian. And Paul says in this passage today, I am the least of the apostles. He wrote this 20 years after he became a Christian. Stay with me. About eight years after that, so this is now 28 years after he became a Christian, Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians, I am the very least of all the saints. Okay, Paul, wait, hold up. That's not the way I thought this thing go. Okay? And then towards the end of his life, he says something beyond belief. Right before Paul dies, he, wrote, he writes 1 Timothy. And Paul says in 1 Timothy, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. Look at the progression of Paul's life. When you have a grace identity, your life doesn't go like this. That's a performance identity. When you have a grace identity, your life goes like this. I said, your life doesn't go like this. It goes like this. Early in Paul's life, in the first 20 years, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. There's no shame in that. Some of us are like, come on, Paul. Why you? Come on, false humility, Paul. All right. You're the least of the apostles. There ain't no shame in being the least of the apostles. The apostles were, were God's chosen vessels to take his message. The apostles were the ones who wrote scripture. The apostles were the ones who planted churches. And there's nothing wrong with being the least of the apostles. But then Paul says a little later, I'm the least of the saints. Okay, nobody's putting that on their resume. <laughs> nobody's saying I'm the least of the people of God. Because saints mean the people of God. But, so Paul said, I'm the least, not just of the apostles, but the, I'm the least of the people of God. But then as an old man, right before he dies, right before he meets Jesus face to face, he says, I am the chief of sinners. Paul says, I'm not just the least of the saints, I'm the least of the ain'ts. The more he used Jesus as his cheat code, the more his identity shifted. The more you use Jesus as your cheat code, the more your identity shifts, which is why the only response to grace is gratitude. You know you have not really internalized the power of grace when you don't feel grateful for everything you have. <laughs> grace leaves no room for boasting. If you're boasting in what you have, you're boasting how much money you make, what job you work at, how many followers you have. If you're boasting in who you're dating, who you're married to, who you're, what your kids do, that means that you don't understand yet the superpower of grace. Grace doesn't even leave room for complaining. We can only complain when we contribute. How are you going to complain when everything you have is by grace? Well, God, I'm mad at you. God, I'm mad at you. God, I'm mad at you. I'm mad at you. I'm mad at you. You, 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 you took away this person. You, 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 you took away this person in my life. 
And God is like, I took somebody away who I, already, who I gave you by grace to begin with? No, God, I'm mad at you for not giving me more money. Okay, so you're mad at me for not giving me more than I already gave you by grace to begin with. Yeah. God, I'm mad at you. I'm mad at you for not healing this pain in my body. You mean the same body that I gave you by grace? The body you didn't earn? You, weren't, you didn't have to be born that way? You didn't have to be born with that body? The same body that you didn't earn, you mad? That I gave you by grace? God, these kids, but wait, didn't you pray for kids? God, this church, but wait, didn't you pray for a church? I mean, help me, somebody. What do you have to complain about? Everything that you have, you've been given. The Bible says, what do you have that you have not received? What do you have that you have not received? And that right there offends us, but it shouldn't. It only offends people who want the credit. It don't offend me. I'm grateful for the grace of God. But if you want to change, there's no bigger blessing than grace. And that leads me to my last point. Grace levels us up. Somebody say grace levels us up. Paul ends today's passage by saying, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Fun fact, um, this verse actually I used to write on the bottom of my baseball hat. You know, I, know I was an athlete for some of y'all that don't know, and you know, Pastor Cat, a little scale, you know, I was a little, you know. It's a little nice, a little baseball player. And I used to write this verse on the bottom of my baseball cap. It actually became my life verse because it was a picture of what I am, right? I kept my testimony close to my ministry. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace was not given to me in vain, but instead I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. I'm not flexing. I'm living that. But by the grace of God... I am what I am, but by the grace of God, his grace was not given to me in vain, yet I labored harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Paul says, grace didn't stop my hard work, it motivated it. Grace didn't stop my hustle, it inspired it. When we become a Christian, most of us turn our hustle off. We turn our entrepreneurial energy down. Our, uh, our goals and our grind goes ghost after we meet Jesus. We turn down all these things, these creativities, these images, these visions, and we think that everything that we used to do is wrong and not useful. And God is saying to somebody today, your intensity wasn't wrong, your intentions were. Did that help somebody? Your intensity wasn't the problem. Your intentions were the problem. But now that you have a new heart, somebody say new heart, I want you to keep that same energy. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, God wants you to keep that same energy. Turn to your neighbor and let your neighbor know. Let, let your other neighbor know, God wants you to keep that same energy. See, gratitude is always better fuel than fear. Fear will drive you into the ground. Fear will drive you to burnout. Fear will drive you into bitterness. Fear will drive you into brokenness. But grace, my God, I said, but grace. Grace will have you doing and doing things just as hard, if not harder, but for completely different reasons. Paul says, that's what I was, but by the grace of God, this is what I am. Do you have a but by the grace of God in your life? Do you have a but by the grace of God in your life? I was addicted to porn, but by the grace of God. Without my medication, I might go buck wild in this place but by the grace of God. If I was the old me, I would put hands, shoulders, knees, and toes on you. I'm gonna say this to the real section. I said, if I was the old me, I would have put hands, shoulders, knees, and toes on you, but by the grace of God. 
Some of the people that are running the hardest after God are not just running to something, they're running from something. I said they're running so hard, not because they're running to something, but they're running from something. They're running from what they were. They're running from how they thought. They know if I get a day that I don't get in God's presence, I'm going to sink into a depression. I'm going to be out here wilding. My legs are going to be open. My account's going to be open. I'm going to be swiping, and I'm going to be purchasing, and I'm going to be... I run so hard because I'm not just running to something. I'm running from something. Without a but by the grace of God, every win will get to your head and every loss will get to your heart. A million dollars worth of gain for $9.99. But by the grace of God, without that, Every win will get to your head. Every win in your life, you'll start feeling good about yourself. I'm good. I got this. I don't really need God. Yeah, I go to church. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. But I could go three months without coming. I can go a week without praying. I could go weeks on end, months on end, without even reading the word. The only word I get is what my pastor gives me on Sunday. What Pastor K preaches. Other than that, I don't got no relationship with God's word. Without a but by the grace of God, every win will get to your head and every loss will get to your heart. When you lose, it no longer becomes a loss. It becomes your identity. Failure becomes your identity. But let me give you something for free. Failure is an event, not a person. I said failure is an event, not a person. I fail, but I'm not a failure. You can, you can try to label me that and I'm a... Get that label off me because I'm not a failure. Failure is an event, not a person. Without a but by the grace of God, we don't change and have this advantage because grace means God forgets my sin but still remembers me. Who's grateful for that? Who's grateful that God forgets your sin but still remembers you? Forgets what you said, but still remembers you. Forgets what you did, but still remembers you. That's how you know you are not what you do. I got to move. When your identity is rooted and grounded in grace, you're not afraid to fail because he was forsaken. You can handle anybody's no because you already have his yes. I want to close on this. I want to close on this. I want to I tell y'all a story. Um, have you ever gotten something that, like, you don't deserve? Like, I mean, like, you really, like, don't deserve. Like, it, it's reminded you of God's grace. Well, I had, an, I had an encounter like that early in my ministry. So I had a meeting scheduled with, with my life group leaders at the time, and this was early in my ministry uh, at my old church. And, you know, y'all know I'm busy. Y'all know y'all pastor busy. I'm busy, busy, busy. And I was even less, I was less busy then than I am now. I had less responsibility. I had less kids. Woo, Lord. Had less kids. Had less responsibilities. I hadn't started the gathering. I didn't even know the gathering was in me. I didn't even know I was pregnant with this church. So I, I was in a whole nother space. Um, but we had this meeting scheduled because they were going through some things in their life group. And and they were facing some problems that I was going to help them solve, and I was just going to speak into them, and I was going to pour into them a little bit. So the day comes, and I'm supposed to meet them at Wahi Diner. Wash Heights. Where you at? Wash Heights. And I go through my regular routine like I do every week. I picked up my oldest son from school. We head to the house. And it never dawned on me at any point that I had this meeting on my calendar that I had scheduled for weeks. So I get home with my son, and we start wrestling. And I hit him with the Stone Cold Stunner, pow, boom. And we going in. I mean, I'm Stone Cold Stunning him. I, I mean, meanwhile, my leaders are at the place that we were supposed to meet. And I don't even know that they're there. So 15 minutes go by, and they call, AOPK, we here. Just letting you know, we here. We, we waiting for you. And then 30 minutes go by. APK, haven't heard from you. 
Um, you know, we here though. You know, so let us know where you at. Give them, you know, you know, y'all know how y'all get. Passive aggressive people say amen. And then 45 minutes go by. Yo, PK, um, did something happen to you? We're worried about you. We're gonna call Shanika. Like, is everything okay? Meanwhile, my phone in the other room, on the charger, and I'm hitting my son with the people's elbow. Do you smell? <laughs> and when I finally got to the phone, over an hour after the meeting was scheduled, and I saw all of the texts and missed calls, I was devastated. I was devastated because I pride my ministry on integrity, not perfection, but consistency. And when I dropped the ball like a fumble, I just wanted to curl up in the corner and cry. There's few things that I've ever cried about. I wanted to cry. I wanted to cry because I felt like I let my leaders down. I wanted to cry because I felt like I let God down. And I called them up and apologized and apologized and apologized and apologized. And finally, I met one of them. And when I met with them in person, one of them said to me, Kenny, it's okay. I forgive you. I know it was a mistake. I know who you are. I know what you stand for. You're still my pastor. I'm still rocking with you. I still love you. And finally, in my mind, something clicked. Something clicked and I stopped, and I stopped replaying everything that I failed to do. But she had been saying that all along. And why did it take me so long to finally receive it? Well, God revealed it to me this week. The reason why it took me so long to receive her grace was because that's the same way I respond to his. The reason why most of us has, have never experienced this cheat code is because we think that beating ourselves up works better than grace. We think beating ourselves up works better than grace. We think holding grudges works better than grace. We think, we think being bitter works better than forgiveness. But Jesus is looking at somebody today and saying, stop beating yourself up for something I already took the beating for. Stop beating yourself up for something I already took the beating for. Somebody's in here beating themselves up and what the enemy does to you is he weaponizes your shame. Because the only advantage he has over you and power he has over you is when you live based on your performance. He can weaponize your performance against you. But failure isn't final. I said failure isn't final. It's covered in Jesus' blood. That's why his last words on the cross to you weren't, you failure. You know what his last words to you were? It is finished. It is finished. If your cheat code says it's finished, guess what? It's finished. If your cheat code says you're free, guess what? You're free. If your cheat code says you're forgiven, guess what? You're forgiven. If your cheat code says you're loved, then guess what? You are loved. Stop performing for things he already paid for. Let grace be your identity, not your performance. And watch how quickly you level up in faith, hope, and love. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father God, we thank you for God's riches at Christ's expense. God, we thank you for grace, that medicinal bomb called grace, that, that thing that touches all of the sores and empty gashes and wounds of our hearts. We thank you for that grace ministers your power and your love and your peace to us. God, I'm praying today that we stop beating ourselves up for stuff you already took the beating for. God, I pray today that we stop trying to carry on our backs what you hold in your hands. 
Lord, I pray today that we stop thinking that performance works better than grace. And as you do that in our lives, Lord, I'm praying that a real practical superpower shifts everything that we do and everything that we believe we are called grace. We thank you even now in advance for what you're going to do in our lives from this sermon. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.